Confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father, who is in heaven. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be lost, and the last shall be first. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God. The Lord says, He who loves father or mother, son or daughter, wife or children, more than me, is not worthy of me. And then in another place, he says to those who will be his disciples, that they must deny themselves and lose their life for his sake if they want to find it. And again, we've heard this morning that those who have left everything, father, mother, brother, sister, bones, and land, these are the ones who will be with the Lord. These are very hard sayings, are they not? But would we think it a hard saying if a woman said to her suitor, if you do not leave off from chasing after other women, whether in your mind or with your eyes or with your legs, and love me with all your heart as your one and only, you are not worthy of me. Would we not think her hard say to be altogether reasonable? How was what the Lord says this morning any different? And what woman would rue the day she left father, mother, brother, sister, houses and lands to be joined to a wonderful, faithful man as her husband who cherishes her and loves her as she loves him? Would she not consider that to be the day that she found herself and really began to live? 
With these little illustrations, I mean to say that our gospel this morning is a nuptial gospel. It captures the essence of the Bible. Not to mention the primal inner essence of reality. Which is a cosmic love story. A romance of the heavenly bridegroom and his bride, the church. For Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, known to the prophets of old as Sophia, wisdom, Hokma, which is feminine in both Hebrew and Greek. She is more beautiful than the sun, says Solomon in the, pro in the wisdom of Solomon. And when he beheld her, Solomon became a lover of her beauty. He was enraptured by her. And he longed for her. I think we could say that he chased after her. He longed for her from his youth, he says. He longed to make her his spouse. So the Lord's word in our gospel this morning is the word of Sophia. Because Christ is Sophia. He's the wisdom of God. And Christ, the Lord's word this morning, is the word of Sophia to all who love beauty and all who long to know it and to become one with it. Sophia, the beauty and wisdom of God, will not consider us worthy of her until we leave off from chasing after other lovers, the idols of our passions, and love Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the wisdom of God incarnate, the heavenly bridegroom who comes at midnight with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Those who love me, the Lord says, keep my commandments. He says this in at least four places. He says it once in Exodus. He says it once in Deuteronomy. And then he says it twice in one chapter in John. And the proverb says, The commandment of God is a lamp, and the law of God a light. I was reading from the Psalms not long ago, and I came upon Psalm 119 in the Septuagint, Psalm 119 in the King James, verse 105. Thy law is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my paths. And it struck me suddenly with great force, like a light that went on in my head, that the light in which God created the world is the law of God. And the law of God was made manifest in the beginning as a divine commandment. God said, let there be light, and there will be light. That is to say that the law of God is the form of the uncreated light that shines forth from wisdom, Sophia, who is the very brilliance of the Father's radiance, so that the world, created in light, came to be in the uncreated light of the law of God. It came to be in the uncreated light of Sophia, the wisdom of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. But did you know that the ancients saw the law as the form of divine beauty? A synonym for law was harmony. For the law establishes everything in its right proportions to make for beauty and harmony. Therefore, when God said, let there be light and there was light, it means, let there be law. Let there be beauty. Let there be harmony. Let the life and light of Sophia, the wisdom of God, shine out of the darkness in the form of the law so that creation and everything in it comes to be in the law of God. 
it comes to be in divine beauty and harmony. It comes to be in light, that is to say, it comes to be in the knowledge of God. And in life, that is to say, it comes to be in communion with God. And therefore, when it says in St. John's Gospel, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, well, guess what? It's the same verb that you read in Genesis 1-3, where it says, let there be light. The only difference is that in Genesis 1-3, it's, it's in the form of a commandment. It's the, it's the imperative. Let there be. It's the same verb that you read in John 1.14, and the word became flesh. It's the same verb. But in John, it's an indicative. It's a declarative verb. And when, so when John says in St. John's Gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, it means that the uncreated light of divine wisdom in whom the world came to be, that divine wisdom himself became flesh. And that means that our flesh, our body, and everything about us, our mind, our soul, and the world that were in darkness because of our sins and trespasses, it means that when God the Word, God the Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, when he became flesh, it means that, that our body became light. It means that the world became light. It means that our body, it means that creation was deified because God was in it. He was mingling himself in it. He was becoming part of it. It means that our body and all of creation was cleansed of all unrighteousness. And unrighteousness is death. So it means that creation and our bodies were cleansed of all death. And they were restored to their original beauty. And the uncreated light of wisdom in whom and by whom all things were created. Therefore, dear faithful, what are we to do? if we have awakened as if from sleep, to see that our soul longs for the beauty of God that never fades. And yet we see how ugly we are, how dark, because our heart has become deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Well, the Lord's word tells us what we do we begin to keep the law of God, which is Christ himself, after all. Christ is the telos, he's the goal, he's the consummation, he's the perfection of the law. Romans 10, 4. I've said it before, it's easy to remember. Christ is the end of the law. Romans 10, 4. We just keep the law of God, which is Christ himself. And we begin to walk in the way of his commandments, in the hidden man of our heart. This begins, this walking in the law of God. It begins by laying aside every excuse, all rationalizations, all blame shifting and self justifications, and acknowledging our sins to the Lord in the hidden man of our heart. When we do this, we set ourselves on the path of divine beauty. And if the path of divine beauty is Jesus Christ himself, then when we set ourselves on that path and begin walking on it, we will be uniting ourselves to Christ as we swore that we would do at our baptism. And in uniting ourselves to Christ according to our baptismal oath, we will be walking in the Holy Spirit of Christ. And the Holy Spirit of Christ will come to us because we are uniting ourselves to Christ. And he will, be, he will abide in us because we are choosing to abide in Christ by keeping his commandments. And he will cleanse us and purify us of all unrighteousness, which means that he will empty our souls of death and corruption as he did the Lord's tomb. 
This is what it is to leave father, mother, brother, sister, houses, and lands for the Lord's sake, to become one with the heavenly bridegroom, become his wife, his bride. This is what it is to lose our life for his sake, that we may find it. We begin now to find our life, not in our father or mother or our homeland, but we begin to find our life in the law of God, in the beauty of God, in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now is when the resurrection of Christ begins to work in us and to reveal itself to us. As we acknowledge and confess our sins to the Lord, and repentance, in repentance begin to walk in the way of the Lord's commandments, he cleanses us of all unrighteousness, all of our death and corruption. And as he cleanses us, as he empties the tomb of our heart of all of its old deceit and corruption, what comes into view is our original beauty. This is our true self. And as we begin to live in beauty, and become more and more beautiful, aligned with our true self, we discover the primordial longing of our heart. It is not a longing for the world that is passing away. It is a longing for Christ, the only lover of mankind, the heavenly bridegroom, who, as it happens to be, is our master, our fashioner, and our goal. He is our beginning and he is our end. For he is the he is the image of God, the icon of God, in whom we came to be, and in whom we find our true destiny. Like the bride loves her husband more than her father, mother, brother, sister, homes, and land, and cleaves to her husband in love, and finds her rest and her joy in him. So we love the Lord, our heavenly bridegroom, more than father and mother, brother, sister, homes, and land. And we cleave to him in love. We become one spirit with him because he became bone of our bones and flesh of our flesh. We love him because he first loved us. We find our rest and our joy no longer in the world, but in Christ Jesus the wisdom and beauty and power of God. For he is our heavenly bridegroom. He is the only lover of mankind. And it says, and I don't know how many places in Holy Scripture, in one way or another, he alone satisfies our every desire. But our Lord promises, if we love him more than these, we gain them all back a hundredfold. The man and the wife, the man and his new bride, they leave their family to cleave to one another in love for each other as each other's one and only. And in so doing, they each one gain a whole other family. The in-laws become outlaws, the outlaws become in-laws. When we leave our earthly families in order to cleave to Christ as our heavenly bridegroom, we gain his heavenly father as our father. We gain his all-holy virgin mother as our mother. And we gain all the saints as our brothers and sisters. And in the love of Christ's holy resurrection, we live in the real hope that we may gain our father, mother, brother, and sister a hundredfold that we left, or even if they have died, because we have gained them, we gained them in Christ. That means that we gained them in Christ's death, by which he destroyed death. And that means that we gained them in his holy resurrection. And in his holy resurrection, we will never lose them. For in Christ, death has been destroyed. Jesus Christos Nika, 
Jesus Christ, the love of God, has conquered all. Look on your cross as if you have any letters on your cross. That's what it's spelling out. It looks like I-C-X-E-N-I-K-I. Jesus Christos Nico. Nika. Jesus Christ has conquered all. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Most holy Theotokos, save us.